see you all here today. Thank you for being here. If you'd like to take your copy of God's Word and join me in turning to the New Testament Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6 is where we'll be today. Luke chapter 6. A little bit of housekeeping before I get into the message. First of all, I want to say uh, a massive thank you to our church family for uh, really the work, the prayers, your kindness as we had a, uh, an open house Sunday last week. And I know as a pastor it can be frustrating at times when I feel like I expend too much energy trying to get our church interested and excited about something, and that takes away from energy that can be actually invested in the outreach of it all. And about six weeks before Open House Sunday, we announced it. Of course, it's been on our calendar all year, but uh, for four weeks, I preached a sermon series, The Church Alive, where every week we talked about a church that's alive will do things, and Open House is a great opportunity to do those. And so many of you uh, invited people, and many of those you invited came, and, and uh, I am so grateful for, for that. Um, we have a guest survey that not every guest, but a lot of our guests will fill out, and uh, I was reading through some of the responses that John forwarded over to me, and, and uh, one of our guests said, from the moment we drove in by the traffic control ministry and through our time there, we felt welcomed. And I thought, that's wonderful that they pulled on the parking lot, literally pulled on the parking lot. And uh, their first impression was, we're welcome here by the way we're being treated. One uh, simply put, I loved the music. And uh, someone else said something nice about the preaching. I was glad for that. Okay, they said that. Uh, one, one literally said, uh, the music and the sermon were a tie. <laughs> so that's good. We're working together there. Uh, one, one family said that Coastline was... Uh, 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 overwhelmingly gracious. Another said, we were made to feel welcome and at home. It was very sincere. And if you guys are anything, I believe it's sincere. Uh, glad for that. A very positive, down to earth atmosphere. Uh, one wrote, I felt zero judgment and, and uh, I could go on. But what I, what I wanted to share with you is thank you for loving others the way Jesus would have us to. And it is our goal that we'd be an authentic community of faith where we gather together around the Word of God and we live out the truths of the Lord. And uh, I was glad for you guys doing that. Uh, tonight at 5.30 we have our evening service. A lot of you know I've been in a study on the life of David. And uh, for the last several studies that we've been in, uh, David's been being kind. He hit a point in time where a lot of the battles had been fought. He assumed the authority there as the king in Jerusalem. The nation was united. He's been kind and kind and kind and we're going to find out tonight what do you do when your kindness is not appreciated when it's taken for granted and uh, so uh, I'd encourage you to be out here tonight we're going through a passage of scripture that uses the word buttocks all right so if that bothers you you need to know in advance but uh, it's an exciting passage you won't want to miss uh, what we cover tonight uh, it's going to go ways I think you'd say I never saw that one coming all right so uh, it's in the Bible we got to cover it we just go through every verse one after the other and so so I'm looking forward to that. And then finally, uh, I, I wanted to add, you know, the announcement today for the ladies event. Uh, I'm not a lady, so I won't be there. But if you are a lady, you should be there. You owe it to yourself. And uh, it's not this Thursday, but the next Thursday, we're moving the small groups that meet on Thursday to Wednesday. And of course, that's to accommodate the Friday, Saturday ladies conference. And so I'm glad for that. Our small groups have been just booming. You know, uh, John, I bet if we went back a little more than a year ago before we added these groups throughout the week, we, we've got way more people coming. It's incredible. And so thank you guys for supporting uh, the small groups and being a part of those. I enjoy my group. My meet's on 7 o'clock on Friday morning and uh, I enjoy that because we meet at a restaurant and we get to eat food so that's always good but uh, if you'd like more information about a small group you can see any of the uh, tents out front we'd love to help you with that all right Luke chapter 7 is where we're going to be in our study today and we're in week two of our new teaching series that we've entitled Traction. And uh, as I thought and prayed and prepared for this series I got more and more excited because I realize that we're covering in this, this study issues that we all deal with, issues that we all face. There's no one in this room this morning who can go through this series and say, yeah, that one wasn't for me, because if you have a pulse, this series is for you. We're dealing with real life issues. When life brings a transition that creates a tension that can rob us of traction, what is it that we're to do? And God's word has the answers. I wanted to begin today by telling just a brief story 
There was a time in my life, in my late teen years, where uh, our family went through a real difficult time. And of course, I'm not unique in that. I think we all have a story. This one just happens to be mine. But uh, I was in my late teen years. Our family went through this season. My, uh, my folks separated. And uh, of course, that's not easy in any, any situation. My dad was living on his own and uh, kind of lost touch with him even for a time during that season. And my mom, who was having a difficult time with all of it, she went to stay with my oldest brother. And so here I am in my late 10 years, teen years living all alone in my family home, Uh, living in a neighborhood in Long Beach and three bedroom, two bath home. And uh, here I am as a teenager and and everything that gave me confidence at that point in my life was gone. And uh, so here I am uh, on my own. And I felt in a lot of ways like the bottom had dropped out. Uh, All the structure, all the people, everything that kind of made life for me work at that stage of my life was gone. And and it seemed that uh, uh, I was alone in a way I hadn't felt before. To make matters more challenging, I was raised in a Christian home. Not just a Christian home, I mean a go to church every time the doors are open kind of Christian home. And I couldn't help at that stage in my life but think, wait a minute, I thought we were a Christian family. And I thought Christian families didn't go through stuff like this. I I thought this is the kind of thing that happens to other people, not our family. And so I began to grapple with the fact, wait a minute, is, is this even real? Have we been playing a game? Was this kind of charade? What's going on? This is not supposed to happen. I thought through those things. And I began to grapple with some questions that at that point in my life I'd never really dealt with before. I remember thinking, specifically thinking, am I really a Christian or am I just doing this because that's what my family had done? I wondered, how do I know that Christianity is, is even right? And it's implied when we say that Christianity is correct, that, that other systems of belief are not. And I began to wonder, how do we know that what we believe is right? And questions like these sent me into a season of doubt. As I went through this, I I thought, am I the only person to have had thoughts like these? And here's the dirty little secret about doubts. We all have them. We all have times in life where it seems like the bottom has dropped out, and all we seem to have in those moments are, are questions. There's not one thoughtful person thoughtful person. There's not one thoughtful person that doesn't entertain some tough questions from time to time. And there are different kinds of doubts. I I wouldn't know all of the different kinds of doubts, but there are what we might call intellectual doubts. Did Jesus really walk on the water? How did the miraculous things work? You know, was there really a flood? And, And we began to have these intellectual kind of doubts at times. Other times, there are more spiritual doubts. We began to ask ourselves questions like, am I really a Christian? And if I am, why is the Christian life so difficult for me? Sometimes we have circumstantial doubts, and and those would be those times where we wonder, man, why do these bad things happen? And I want you to know that doubts in and of themselves are not sinful. They're similar to temptation in the sense that it's how we respond to them that determines the impact that they have on our lives. I want you to understand that. You, You see, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Having times when we have questions that are not easily answered is a perfectly normal part of the Christian life. And I hope today to share with you from the Bible some truths that will help all of us to gain some traction when those times of doubt come to our lives. What are we to do with the questions we are asking when the answers we seek are not easily found? And again, you are not alone in this. In fact, it's not even a sign that you're a weak Christian. There's nothing more patronizing than when we're going through a difficult season for, for somebody to just imply, well, you know, you, you've just got problems. You're probably really weak. I, I don't even believe it's a sign that you're a weak Christian. And I say that because one of the strongest preachers in the, in the New Testament went through a season of doubt. His name was John the Baptist. We call him John the Baptist because he baptized a lot of people and to distinguish him from other people in the Bible named John. And and John the Baptist was an incredible man of faith. And as we observe his experience, we can find some encouragement for each of our lives today. So if you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing as we read the word together. If you're glad you're in church, say amen. Amen. Luke chapter 7. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. Luke 7 and verse 18. 
The Bible says, and the disciples of John showed him all these things. Now I'm going to read on, and I'll touch on this even again later, but we have the disciples of John speaking to him as he's in prison about what's happening in the life of Christ. All right, so John's getting a report as he's confined, and uh, they're telling him about the things that are happening in Jesus' ministry. John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. And Jesus says this, he said, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? Remember, John ministered in the wilderness, and so he's asking them, when when John was ministering, what did you go into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet. Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is an amazing passage. I want you to go back and look in the middle of verse 19. We find a few words there that serve as the question around which the doubts came in John's life. And the words in the middle of verse 19 we're going to consider are, Art thou he? Our Father, we're thankful today to know that in a world that's filled with questions that we do find an answer in you. God, I pray that you would allow this message today to prepare some who will be heading into times of doubt, to encourage some who are currently in times of doubt, And uh, Lord, that we would understand there is power in a relationship with you that can help us open our hearts to truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, it wasn't supposed to happen this way. He was just sure if I do what God has told me to do, if I do what God has directed me to do, then then it'll be just fine. And and John went out to do what God told him to do. He prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus. He announced the arrival of Jesus into his ministry. And and then he thought in response, what will happen is Jesus will right all the wrongs. He will assume his rightful position as king. And I will rule and reign with Jesus and live happily ever after. But that's not at all how it went. In an unjust turn of events, John, for preaching the truth, was put in prison. And that's where he is when we find him in this text. Have you ever had a time when you were sure how things would go? They didn't go that way. You were disappointed. And those times shake us. When we're just sure. And then all of a sudden we're not. This is exactly what happened to John as he sat in prison wondering what's going on. Historians believe that John was in prison for about 10 months. In the end of his time in prison, he was executed for his obedience and faith and for following Jesus Christ. And and they further believe that he's been in prison about three or four months at the time of the, of the passage we're reading and studying today. And, and so John's alone in his cell. It's giving him time to think of all that's happening to him. And things just weren't adding up. 
He's saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. This is not how it was supposed to go. He had questions, and there were no answers coming from the walls in his prison cell. One bright spot for John was the fact that some of his closest followers and friends could visit him. And on one day, John asked his friends, after thinking this and entertaining these thoughts in his heart, he, he asked his friends, hey, listen, I need you to take a question to Jesus. I'm not free to go. You guys are. I want you to go to Jesus and ask him a question for me. And I want you to listen carefully to this question. John asked this, art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And we have to really understand that question if we're going to get into the heart and mind of John the Baptist and learn from him. He was was really asking something quite deep here. In fact, that expression, he that should come, was a direct reference to the one who was promised in the Old Testament. The Messiah, uh, often called the Son of David, the, the promised Son of God. And so John sends a question to Jesus. Hey, are you him or not? Should we be looking for another? Now what's interesting about this is John had invested his entire life declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. He prepared for the arrival of Jesus. He announced the arrival of Jesus. One day while ministering down by the river, he he sees Jesus coming. And in John 1 verse 29, John declared this. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was saying, this is him. I told you he's coming. And here he is. He announced to everyone that Jesus truly was the Messiah, the promise of God. And yet we find the preacher, if you would, doubting. He's saying, you know, I just can't put this together in my mind. I never saw it happening like this. I I need some answers. John wasn't just doubting an element of his life. He was doubting the essence of his life. What do you do when life shakes you to the core? How do you handle those moments when those questions you are asking not only have ramifications for that moment, that time in which you're living, but ramifications that cover your entire life? Well, I believe we find some powerful counsel in this passage that can help us when we deal with doubts from time to time. Principles that teach us how to gain traction that will allow us to move forward in faith. As we look to this passage together, and if you have your note takers journal there nearby, the first element I see in this text is is an encouragement to do this. Give Jesus the benefit of your doubts. The benefit of your doubts. Let's go to verse 18. The Bible says in that passage there, and the disciples of John showed him all these things. Now again, the things they communed to John were about the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now don't forget, John used to have the big crowds. He was the talk of the town. He was the one that others were paying attention to and listening to, and now he's in jail, and his followers are saying, man, Jesus, he's, he's got even bigger crowds. He's doing big things, and, and so John is hearing of these things, and friends, I want you to know today, it is not coincidental that John entered into a season of doubts during the midst of a difficult and trying time in his life. Doubts are essentially questions which which, uh, we wrestle with in our minds, and yet I have found that the best thing we can do with our questions is to interrogate them. When those questions plague us, we need to plague them. We need to get to the bottom of them. We need to discern what is going on. We, We need to ask ourselves questions like, why is this doubt in my life at this moment? Why did it pop up now? We need to ask, what's happening in my life that prompted me to think this? What changes are taking place? And essentially what had changed in John's life was his personal situation. Jesus had not changed. His message had not changed. His work had not changed. It was John's life that had been changed by the hardship through which he was going. And friends, I certainly would not want to make light of the various struggles through which you go. I don't feel lightly when I go through struggles. But I think it needs to be pointed out. If you're listening, say amen. I think it needs to be pointed out. If we're going to be honest and give Jesus the benefit of our seasons of doubt, we have to recognize that most of the time our minds are blown and we're plagued by doubts. It's because something's happening in our lives that's prompting them. It, it needs to be pointed out that many times it's those unmet expectations, those disappointments that drive our doubts. So when an uncomfortable change comes to our lives, we have a God who never changes, a God who welcomes our questions. In Malachi 3 and verse 6, the Lord said, I am the Lord, I change not. 
In Hebrews, we read of Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am aware that this first thought I'm sharing with you this morning will not answer all the questions you have. I'm aware of that. I'm not pretending it does. I, I don't think that giving Jesus the benefit of your doubts is going to instantly bring all the answers to all of the questions that you might have. But I am saying today that answers will no, never come until we give God the opportunity to hear them out. And friends, we know something today. It matters not if you're a follower of Jesus or not. If we're being honest today, we would have to at least recognize the world doesn't have the answers. We've been asking the same questions uh, for, for all of time. I mean, you can, you can think of the great philosophers up to the philosophers in our day, and we're still asking questions like, who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? I mean, the basic meaning of life, we have to acknowledge the world doesn't have a clear cut out answers. And so I want to encourage you today to let your doubts serve as a benefit by taking them to the Lord. That leads to the second thought that we find in this passage in the end of verse 19, it it emerges, and the second thought is this. Keep the main thing the main thing. Now, we know of the question that John asked. The text makes it clear, but I couldn't help but think of all the questions John didn't ask. He could have asked, like, um, so I did what I was supposed to do. Why am I in jail? Why did you let that happen? Why did you allow my life's work to be taken from me? Why are you not getting rid of our Roman captors and reigning as king? He, he could have had a ton of questions. But John knew, you know, there's one question that if I can get answered, we'll put all the other questions in their place. There's one question I need to get nailed down. In verse 19, he gave us that question. He asked of Jesus, are you him? <laughs> He said, art thou he that should come, or look we for another? He was basically, listen to this, he was basically telling the Lord, uh, listen, Jesus, if you can answer this one question, and if I can nail this one matter down of you indeed being the promised one, God the Son, my Lord and Savior, if I can settle this issue right here and now, I can deal with all the other stuff life will throw at me. This is the main thing. He said, I got to get this for sure. Reminds me of those who were looking for Jesus in Matthew 22. And, and there we read this. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. Again, another moniker for, for Jesus being God. And, and friends, it all comes down to what we think of Christ. The question was, what think ye of Christ? What often happens in our seasons of doubt is we have one unanswered question that was prompted by Something we're personally going through. So we're reevaluating all of the world because we're hurting. And I get that. That's what was happening to John. It's like, no doubts, we're going along pretty good. Boom. We get a bad medical report. We get a bad financial report. We have adversity, difficulty, a trial, something like that. It prompts these questions. And, and we don't have an answer to that question. And what so often happens is that one question rolls into another. And before we know it, we've built a circumstantial case in our minds against the goodness of God. And it seems that the unanswered questions will defeat our faith. But friends, when you wrestle with the issue of the lordship of Jesus Christ, you will find that in the course of life, you'll gain answers that you never thought you would. And those issues that you don't really ever come to figure out. You can leave those unanswered questions confidently in the presence of Jesus when you know him to be your Lord and Savior and God. John said, you know, I'm going to keep the main thing here. Let's cut to the chase. I got a lot of questions I could ask. Why me? Why now? Why here? He said, listen, let's just keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus, are you him or not? Friends, I want to tell you today, in your times of doubting, never trade what you do know for what you don't know. A lot of times we throw the baby out with the bathwater because we're going through a time of conflict and adversity and difficulty. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to make light of it. If we, if we want to sit down and compare sad stories, we've all got sad stories. I'm, I'm not making light of it. I'm saying when you go through a storm, don't take uh, the, what is to be our foundation and, and, and remove it. I love that John was willing to go through this season with some consistent uncertainty. And he could do that when he became certain that Jesus is Lord for, for him and us alike. That is the main thing. Start with Jesus. And that leads us to this thought, the third thought I'll share with you today. Learn to listen 
to Jesus. Learn to listen to Jesus. Now, in the verses that follow, we read of John's friends catching up with Jesus during the day, and he was ministering to a large crowd. So that they leave John the Baptist, they go to find Jesus, and when they find Jesus, he's, he's here ministering, and he's doing so many good things, and miraculous things, incredible things. And, and when they finally ask their question, Jesus responds. So they ask Jesus, hey, John wants to know, are you him or not? Do we need to look for another one? In verse 22, here's the response from Jesus. All right, pretty simple question. Are you him or not? Jesus said, go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. Now, what had they seen? They had seen Jesus healing people. What had they heard? They heard Jesus teaching truth. So he said, in response to their question, go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. The question was, are you him or not? Yes or no? And Jesus said, I want you to go tell John all this stuff that I'm doing. And we could say, Jesus didn't answer their question. It was a simple, straightforward, yes or no question, and Jesus did not answer their question. But the fact is, he did. He did. You see, John was a prophet. He was a prophet, and so, as a prophet, he would have been keenly aware, more than most, of what it was the Old Testament told us that Jesus would do. And Jesus tells the followers of John, you've seen what I'm doing here? And with the words he sends back to John, he's reaching back to the Old Testament passages to say, John, you need to check your Bible again. You need to read over those passages again because I'm doing everything that I said that I would do. Jesus' answer was essentially, John, you need to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. Jesus could have given a simple yes, but what he gave was much better. He gave an irrefutable proof. Prophecy was being fulfilled. What was happening was to embolden his faith, not to leave him immersed in doubts. He gave evidence to a heart, a heart in need of help. And to us today, Jesus is saying, as he did in John 5 and verse 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The message of Jesus is, hey, listen to my words. Hear what has been said. It will encourage your heart. One of the best pieces of counsel I can give to someone who's in a time of doubts is, man, get in the Bible. Get in the book. We not only get to know the Lord by getting in the Word of God, but we gain knowledge that ultimately can grow into wisdom that helps us in those tough times. In the 1800s, there was a famous artist well known all throughout Europe and to this day is known around the world Paul Gustave Doré and the story was told in a book I read that he was traveling on one occasion in Europe and he came to a border checkpoint that asked for his passport and he had misplaced his passport and so he explains to the to the guard there that uh, he's a very famous person and he tells him I'm the famous artist Doré and and the guard says yeah sure you are and he pled with him some more. He said, please, just let me in. I can't find my passport, and I'm on this trip. And, and uh, the story goes that uh, the, the, the guard said, no, many people claim to be someone they're not just to get entrance. I'm not going to let you in. And, and yet he persisted, and he continued to plead. And, and the story goes that the guard finally uh, gave him some paper and a pencil, and he said, why don't you, you sketch quickly those people standing there, and we'll see if you are who you say you are or not, and just super fast he he went to work and he began to draw a, a drawing that was incredible when the guard looked at it he just said you may go you surely are who you claim to be and friends when we consider the mosaic that God has painted in his word and in our lives we'll see an evidence that provides the footing we need to get some traction that can lead us forward we need to learn to listen to Jesus that leads us to this final thought I'll share with you today. I want to encourage you in seasons of doubt, build on your blessings. Build on your blessings. As our conversation with Jesus comes to a close, Jesus turns his attention back to the audience and, and he said, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. The word in the New Testament from which we get our English word is a word that sounds a lot like scandalize, scandalizo. It's 
was potentially a scandalous situation. Um, this word is often rendered in English as bait. And through this statement, the Lord's letting us know that John's going through a difficult time, no doubt about it, but it's a time potentially that can serve as a trap. It's as though a trap has been baited, and if, if he doesn't handle this season correctly, it's, it's going to lead him in the wrong direction. Jesus was sharing with us that although John was upset with the Lord for what he was not doing, he didn't have to take the bait. And, and I think of the psalmist in Psalm 91 who wrote this. He said, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the trap of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. And friends, it's good to know today that we have a God who can deliver us from those traps. Jesus was not condemning John for his doubts. He was saying that when doubts come as traps, we don't have to take the bait. And there is a blessing when we honestly deal with them by giving him the benefit of the doubt, by keeping the main thing the main thing, and by listening to his word. Friends, I'm telling you today, there's actually a blessing that comes from properly going through times of doubt. I've found that so often when our doubts come and we take them to the Lord, we come out the other side with a perspective we would have never had any other way. In a, in a beautiful twist of irony, the questions produced by our doubt can provide the traction needed in our growth. So Jesus now begins to teach the crowd that remains after the Friends of John go back, and, and as uh, uh, th their, their uh, ministry there continues, the Lord says this. He said, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? It's kind of an unusual statement. How many of you know there's nothing wasted in the Word of God? So I began to think a reed. Well, I kind of know what a reed is, but... Exactly what's a reed. The specific word Jesus used referred to a reed. It's the arundo donox. There you go. For all the herbivores out there, now you know. <laughs> but what made that reed special well, was it was a reed that was used for measuring things. It's an interesting reed. It, it grows about 12 feet tall. It has a bloom on the top. And, and, and really just a, a breeze can come. And what that reed does is it completely lays over. It doesn't bend in half. It doesn't lean. It completely lays over. Falls to the ground. In verse 28, Jesus said this. He said, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. The one doubting. There's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. I, I've heard it said, Jesus said, he's the best. That's not what he said, but he said, there's none better. John the Baptist, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but, however, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John faced doubts, and Jesus said there is none better, but in the end, he said, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater, and we can imagine if we're believers today, we're in the kingdom of God, how in the world would we be greater than John? Well, I'm not believing necessarily we're all greater in character. But friends, I'm telling you today, we are greater in position. We have God's revelation. We have God's written revelation. We have more knowledge. We have a deeper fellowship through the Spirit. John announced the king in his coming kingdom. And he was like a flashlight in his day trying to pierce the darkness. And friends, we're not just living out of a flashlight. If you're a believer today, we're living in the light. Jesus is to be the light of our lives. So my folks were gone. Just gone. And uh, nothing but doubts. So I wrestled with those doubts. Not a pleasant time in my life. But you can't avoid unpleasant times in life. I had to be reminded the world doesn't have the answers. So if I'm shaken in this, I have to consider what's the alternative? Well, they don't know anything. <laughs> so in time, I picked my Bible back up. And I began to read. 
and study. And it opened my heart up in a way that it had never been opened before. And I still had unanswered questions. And friends, to this day, I still have many unanswered questions. Personally, I came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an irrefutable fact. I studied it in depth. And I had to conclude if Jesus can rise again from the dead, he can probably handle the stuff I can't figure out. So I didn't get every answer, but I got a hold of the answer. Jesus Christ. I continued to just pour through the Word. And then I found a passion to share what I was learning. There's nothing more excited than, than a hungry person who finds food, man. They just want to share it with everybody. So absolutely gut shot. Spend some time wandering. Come back to the Bible. I get in touch with the answer and I'm just... I'm overwhelmed by what I'm learning and now I want to share it with others. And the church I was attending said, do you, well, do you want to teach the children? I said, sure, I'll teach the children. And I began to do my best to share with them what I was learning. And then, then they said, hey, how about teaching the singles class? I began to teach that. And before long, I was getting opportunities to teach here and, and preach there. And, and then I returned to college and finished getting a theology degree. And then I served at a church for a couple years. And, and then I came here. And if you were to ask me what brought me to Coastline Baptist Church, I'd have to say doubts. What brought me to a place where I'm trying with my life to share the truth of Jesus as the answer, I would have to tell you it was a time where nothing made any sense at all. Serious doubts that were answered in Christ. What happened was in Him I found traction that allowed me to move forward by faith. Friends, let's be honest with one another. No single sermon's going to answer every question we're going to face. But I promise you, if you give Jesus the opportunity, he'll turn your doubts into a benefit. Give Jesus the benefit of your doubts. If we keep the main thing of the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, as, as we keep that our focus, we're going to be just fine. If we'll listen to Jesus and stay in the Word, we'll learn and grow. And as we grow, we'll find blessings we never knew we had. And we'll look back on that dark time where it seemed like all we had were questions. And as we, through this, gain traction that moves us forward, we're going to look back on that horrible experience and say, God... Were it not for that, I wouldn't be anywhere near where you've brought me today. When the bottom fell out and I thought there's no foundation for my life, I don't know that anything I ever thought was even real. God, were it not for that moment, I wouldn't be in this moment. So I don't want to minimize what you're going through today, but the key is to go through what you're going through. Don't put it in park and just sit there. Don't just sulk. Don't, don't focus on all the minutia. Uh, you, you've got to focus on who is Jesus. And if he is indeed the son of God, let him begin to lead you forward in your life. Our Father, thank you.